Welcome to the local campaign here on Rogers TV. Thanks so much for joining us. Today we will be having our debate with Ward 1, that is Orleans East Cumberland. But before I introduce you to our candidates today, let me go over the format that we're going to be using. So each candidate will have an opportunity for an opening statement. That will be 60 seconds for each candidate. And uh, the order of that was chosen just a few moments ago at, at random. Um, I will certainly introduce those candidates in that order once we get to that. After those opening statements, I will ask a question to one particular candidate. They will have 45 seconds to answer the question, and then we will open that up to a full debate. So the floor will be open, and each candidate will be able to jump in and debate the topic at hand. Following that, um, we are going to have, at the conclusion of that, we will have the original person that I asked the question to. They will have an opportunity to wrap up we, and, and that'll be about 30 seconds, okay? So that's how we're going to go through this. So we will go through this format um, back and forth on these various questions with these open questions. And then of course, to wrap things up in reverse order, um, each candidate will have an opportunity for their closing statements and that will be 60 seconds. So now let's introduce our candidates and I'll do that in order of our random choices that we just had. First of all, we have Rosemi Cantave. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, Rosemi. Thank uh, you. We also have Tessa Franklin. Good morning. And Matthew Luloff. Hey, neighbors. All right, so, Rosemi, first question to you. Um, one of the big topics, of course, that everybody has been talking about is your opening statement. So, we're going to go to our opening statement right now. Rosemi, you have 60 seconds. Thank you. It is an honor for me to be here today. My name is Rosemi Cantav. I am an international medical graduate licensed in Haiti. I currently work as a researcher at the Ottawa Hospital. I live in Orleans with my husband, our two children, and our dog. I'm pursuing to become the next city councillor of Orleans East Cumberland because I live in a tight, neat, neighborhood where we care for each other and I've been listening to my neighbors and I can tell you that as a member of the community myself I can see what the needs are and how I can better help with the community. I'm not afraid of challenge, I am a go-getter and I'm very ambitious. I am a new but a strong voice for an inclusive growing community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosemi. Uh, Tessa Franklin, you have 60 seconds for your opening Thank statement. Thank you, Derek. Uh, hi, my name is Tessa Franklin. I'm the youngest of four kids, and I grew up with a stay-at-home mom and a father who served with the Royal Canadian Dragoons. In 2016, I moved from Rockland to Ottawa to work for Spectrasonic, and for several years, I worked hard to bring some of the world's biggest touring acts to Ottawa while highlighting our local talent. I'm running for city council because Many neighbors feel this way and they feel that they've lost faith in City Hall. We've watched councillors vote against a crucial judicial inquiry for the Rideau Transit Group and the LRT. We've watched a $3 million tax break be, give, be given to a Porsche dealership. And we've watched councillors go to ribbon cuttings and photo ops while residents have struggled to get access to important social services. It's crucial that we bring transparency and accountability back to City Hall. I've built my platform hand in hand with residents and I'm excited to get to work to get Orleans East Cumberland back on track. All right, thank you, Tessa. Um, now we turn our attention, Matthew Luloff, you have 60 seconds for your opening statement. Hi again, neighbors. My name's Matt Luloff and I'm running again to serve you. Over the last four years, I've been there for you every single day. I brought major investments to every single part of our community. I was out in the community helping you through disasters. I spearheaded the largest economic policy that will put our community back on the map. I brought in musical instruments and got rid of fines at our local libraries and solved decades old problems like installing kilometers of sound wall along the 174. And I was able to do this because I know Orleans. I worked at these pools and I played in these parks as a kid. I've gained insights from the neighbors that I talk to every day because I've known you personally for over four decades or almost four decades. You're the people who taught me or went to high school with me. I taught your kids how to swim at Ray Friel and Bob McCory. You were my scout leaders and comrades, my friends and the parents of my friends. You're the people who raised me and over the last four years, my strong team and I have been honored to return the favor. On Monday, October 24th, I'm asking you to be there for me. 
like I've been there for you. All right, that does it for our opening statements. We start off with our first question. Again, uh, we begin with Rosemi Cantab. Rosemi, um, LRT, public transit has been uh, a big issue. One of the issues is, is not simply just the LRT and that situation, but certainly um, the bus system here in Ottawa. What recommendations would you make to improve our public transit system? Thank you, Derek. I can tell you that um, it breaks my heart every time I see people waiting for the bus, especially in the winter time. When those buses are late or don't show up, it is even more a problem. Those people won't get to work on time. And I can tell you that adding more buses to the routes sure will make a difference, but also making sure that the LRT is working and is not always stopped or because of snowstorm or other weather conditions that will make everybody's commute easier and more enjoyable. Thank you. All right, so now that we have done that, we're going to go to an open debate. The floor is open. Um, over to you, candidates. So when it comes to the LRT and bus service in Orleans, since the launch of the LRT, many neighbors have voiced that regular bus service that they need to connect to the LRT is worse than it was before. Their transit times have increased and they're unhappy with service. The first thing we need to do is go back to the drawing board and ensure that these routes are effective, especially routes coming from park and rides. It should not be taking an additional 20 minutes to get from a park and ride to Blair. Above this, residents need bus service that's going to key hubs, recreational hubs, shopping hubs, etc. One of the things we're really excited to have in my platform is a pilot project to get a shuttle bus to the Cumberland Farmers Market. As many neighbors know, it's difficult to park there, it's difficult to get there, but it's an awesome gem in our city and we want to expand that and make sure that recreational hubs and shopping hubs are accessible by bus. You know, over the last four years, I've spent quite a bit of time speaking with, uh, with transit users and those that are operating our transit system. And the biggest complaint that I'm hearing is that the software that City of Ottawa is, is using is not properly allocating time for stops. So what's happening is you've got enough buses to run the system, but unfortunately, uh, the biggest issue is that they don't have enough time to stop. And so oftentimes, you're waiting for your bus, and the bus that's coming after it gets there because they're leapfrogging. We really need to get dig into the system and ensure that we're doing what is required uh, to make sure that those buses are showing up on time. And uh, we need to start listening to our drivers. These are people that are dealing with uh, the customers and the OC Transpo uh, riders every single day. We need to be listening to them and hearing from them to make sure that we can make the improvements that our uh, city deserves. Over the course of this term, I've worked to ensure that there are no or less cancellations on the 39 and the 38, two buses that were receiving quite a few cancellations. One of them replaced uh, the 95, it's one, a bus that used to run every three minutes. We can't have those sorts of cancellations when people are trying to get to the bus. Again, I also uh, created the Route 138, uh, which uh, serves a two, um, two major city facilities, one being uh, the, the Bob McCoy Recreation Complex, and the other being the Ottawa Public Library on Orleans Boulevard, and also bring residents from Convent Glen and Orleans Wood up to be able to shop on Innis Road. Now we want to do some work over the course of this next term to implement the Orleans Economic Corridor Study, which will mean that there'll be options down the hill as well. Just a reminder, it's an open debate, so anybody jump in at any time. We have a few seconds left here. Anybody else? Rosemary? Um neighbors have been complaining as well that the the buses not only don't come on time but sometimes they would be jammed depending on the time of the day so it would be nice to add more buses to the routes so everybody feels safe and everybody gets to where they need to be on time tessa do you want to add anything to that well i think it's not a case of necessarily adding more buses, it's ensuring that the buses that we do have are efficient. Uh, a, big, a big part of our budget is OC Transpo. It's not that we don't have enough money invested or we don't have enough resources, it's that the planning has to be better. Something that's poorly planned and poorly thought out, it doesn't matter how much money you put into it, it's just a band-aid for a poorly planned service. 
You know, I was, I was intrigued at first when I heard about this idea to run a pilot of a shuttle bus out to, uh, to Cumberland Village. You know, I've been speaking with residents in Cumberland Village over the course of the last three months. Um, it is very difficult to even get down Dunning uh, uh, to get there. Uh, residents are upset of heavy vehicle traffic along there. People are going there to do their groceries. I'm not sure that this is a tenable solution, and I don't think that it's affordable either. Uh, but uh, any any way that we can continue to support our local All right, time is up for the debate for. portion. Uh, Rosemary, you have 30 seconds to wrap up this topic. What I would say about transportation in Orleans, East Cumberland, is making sure that the system we have is efficient and making sure that people can get to where they want to be on time will make everybody's life easier. As a city councillor, I will work to make sure that the services we have are used efficiently and that they serve our population better. All right, let's move to our next question. Uh, this next question is to Tessa Franklin. Tessa, um, many feel that there's been a lack of transparency, a lack of public consultation on not only just the major projects, but, but many projects. What would you do or what would you recommend um, to help ensure residents have a voice on, on those projects? Thank you, Derek. Transparency and accountability is the core of my platform and the core of my personal beliefs. Quite frankly, it's been lacking at City Hall for a long time. Community consultation is important and we're prepared and ready to work with residents and small business owners to build a ward where they are proud to live there, they're happy to live there, and their businesses can thrive there. Increased community consultation and holding developers and consortiums account accountable at City Hall is one of my biggest promises to residents. We've seen what happened in the judicial inquiry and we saw what councillors voted against that important inquiry. And I'm ready to bring accountability like that back to City Hall. All right, so that does it for the opening statement on that question. I open it up to everybody on the floor. Feel free to jump in. You know, I've spent the last four years um, out in the community knocking on doors. I don't just knock doors during a campaign. I knock doors all year round and make sure that I'm staying connected with residents. Um, I also attend uh, almost every single, when I can, because I've got two young kids, almost every single community barbecue, uh, and even in the outlying areas uh, around Orleans. I grew up here, I know this area very well. My entire life has been a consultation with the people of Orleans. I don't think that anyone uh, who follows my social media would say otherwise. I answer questions directly in community groups and online, and I don't send people to my staff uh, to answer questions when it comes uh, to the things that are posted on social media. I answer these questions openly and honestly and will continue to do so for the next four years. Without transparency, there can't be trust. If you want the population to trust you and believe in you, you need to be transparent. I can say that as a city councillor, I will make sure that all transactions are being open to the public. Also, we will listen to the population's needs to make sure that what they want is being heard and being taken into actions. We're not here only to say nice things, but we're here to make sure that the population sees what is happening and where their money is going. This is very important for our population. You know, there's absolutely no way that uh, a city councillor can vote uh, in a way that pleases every single person all the time. But it is so important that you take a 30,000 foot view of these issues and do what's best on the whole uh, for everyone. And by listening to everyone's voice and working hard to ensure that you look at everything from all angles, you know, like for a specific example, right? I mean, over the course of uh, the last four years and knocking on doors, all I've heard from seniors is that we need to see more apartments and more rentals in Orleans, right? We need to make sure that our seniors have a place to downsize to when they want to leave their three, four bedroom home and leave it open to a new family to come into our neighborhood. Well, when you work with someone to ensure uh, an owner, a landowner who has the right to develop their own property, when you work with them to ensure that a uh, development that's going in is respectful, like at Brazil uh, on, um, on Prestige Circle, they wanted to put in a 10-story building. I worked with them to reduce that to four to ensure that it fits better into the community. 
I've worked with uh, Dan Doré on a proposal uh, for Tenth Line Road that will see uh, 30 new units of one bedrooms come in for seniors and for younger people uh, that has parking underground so that it doesn't uh, you know, disturb and displace uh, the neighborhood uh, and right in right out on Tenth Line Road. You're not going to be able to please everyone every single time but what you need to do is make sure that you're meeting the needs of your residents for the future. With all due respect, Matt, this question is not about building apartments in Orleans. This question is about accountability and transparency. When you voted against the LRT inquiry, the East End Transit Riders Group asked you why, and they held a poll in a Facebook group, and most of their members agreed that they wanted to see their councillor vote for an inquiry. This was not an extremely divisive issue where people were really split on whether or not we should hold this company that we're paying billions of dollars accountable. When they called you out on this, you responded to them with a bit of spite and seemed to be upset over your previous actions. I completely disagree Residents with that. Have voiced I completely their disagree concerns. with that. We have an auditor general that is able to do this kind of work and identify areas for further study. We have somebody on the payroll at the City of Ottawa, somebody as, as part of the hiring panel that I helped to hire, somebody who has the trust of Ottawa residents, who has a, a salary that can look into these issues and identify areas for previous study. They didn't hold a judicial inquiry uh, at the province, they held a public inquiry and we would have had answers today had the AG All right, their been time, able to do time job. is up for the debate. Uh, Tessa, you have 30 seconds to wrap up on this topic. So when it comes to public inquiries, judicial inquiries, regardless of which one they are, when we learned about the LRT after the province stepped in, we learned about serious issues with safety. We learned about serious issues with private consortiums, private developers lining their pockets with billions of dollars of our money. We also found out about city council conspiring to remove residents' voices. Accountability and transparency is key, and we especially need it with the LRT. All right, that does it for this topic. We move to our next topic, and this uh, we start off with Matthew Luloff. Matthew, you'll have 45 seconds for infrastructure. Um, you know, when it when it comes to roads and so forth in your particular ward, Matthew, uh, a lot of residents concerned that it's not being done. Um, you know, the worst roads not being done on time and not scheduled around other construction. What do you say to those residents about those concerns? You know, over the course of the last four years, I've secured millions of dollars in funding to renew and repair aging infrastructure, including pathway renewals, culvert repairs, road resurfacing, and park upgrades. We resurfaced St. George, the worst road in Orleans. We resurfaced St. Joseph. We've resurfaced portions of Jean d'Arc. We resurfaced Apollo Crater, uh, the, the area around Apollo Crater. We resurfaced Vineyard, one of the oldest streets that has thousands of people traveling on it every single day. We've renewed pathways through Thurlow, Caprahani, Boursier, Roxdale, Father Richard Ward Park, repaired bridges along Bilberry Creek, a basketball re, uh, court resurfaced at Luke Major, a new picnic shelter at uh, Queenswood Ridge Park, and we built Roger Montpetit Park. We've invested significant funds to enhance park facilities and address the community needs when it comes to infrastructure. All right, that does it for your opening 45 seconds. I now open the floor to all candidates to debate this topic. So as we pursue more infrastructure projects, community consultation with small businesses is going to be an extremely important part of this. Um, I have many friends and family friends who own small businesses, including some who endured the Rideau Street closure that lasted for years. Um, and as we pursue these projects, if we're not taking into account what they need and what's gonna help their businesses thrive, we're gonna see serious issues as well. When we pursue these infrastructure projects, we need to do it right the first time. Many times the city will opt for the lowest bidder because it's the cheapest and it's the easiest. If we invest a bit more time and a bit more money into it, we won't have to wait for roads to completely decay and become borderline unusable before we go back and fix them. So this is about Orleans, none of those, oh sorry Rosemary, please go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say also, we need to make sure that when we're resurfacing those roads, that we take into consideration some road closures that need to happen. Because this adds commute time to people getting to work, people getting to school. So making sure that it is done the proper way, sure will make everybody's life easier. Also, we don't want to waste our money. We want to make sure that our money is being used wisely. 
The roads that need the most resurfacing in Orleans right now are residential streets. And when we resurface roads uh, like Vineyard or like St. George, we also do the sidewalks. It's important to make sure that we are making it safer for active transportation users, for our seniors that have been walking on uneven pavement. You know, Cumberland Village, for example, desperately needs their infrastructure upgraded, but they feel like they've been left out of the conversation over the course of the last 20 years since amalgamation. It's time for someone to stand up for infrastructure projects projects and ensure uh, that these uh, projects move forward in a timely fashion and that's something that I did over the last four years and something that I'll continue to do. You'd be hard pressed to find another councillor who delivered more infrastructure investment in their ward over the course of the last four years. And I did that by looking at works that were in progress and getting uh, the contractor to do more to ensure that we could you know, upgrade pathways that were nearby if we were doing curb refits. Let's do the pathway that connects those two curbs at the same time. It saves us money when we look at works in progress and ensure that we can get maximum value out of each contract. With all the respect, Matt, I was in Cumberland recently and it shouldn't, it is not normal for citizens, especially people on wheelchairs, to have to go on Cameron Street in the middle of the road because the sidewalk is not walkable. This is very dangerous, it's putting our population at risk, it's causing safety issues and I was in the market, I witnessed a lady fall because of the sidewalk that was not walkable. People might not be aware, but the ward boundaries have changed uh, over the course of the last four years. I have not represented Cumberland Village. This is the first that I'm, that I'm learning of these, uh, of these major issues and directly from residents. These are things that I've experienced over the course of the last little bit. But you actually need to be the councillor in that area to be able to make those improvements. Councillor Kitts has done a very good job when it comes uh, to, to getting everything done up to Cameron Street. And I'm going to continue the hard work that she's done to upgrade the infrastructure in Cumberland Village. Both candidates here are correct that Cumberland has been neglected when it comes to infrastructure. When I was at the Cumberland Farmers Market last week, we were parked far up a side street, and we had to walk in the middle of the road for about 20 minutes to get to the market. Not only do they need improved infrastructure, but they need traffic calming measures, and they need things like a shuttle bus to prevent a bunch of cars parked up and down all of their streets that have no sidewalks. No one's going to take the bus to do their groceries, and imagine trying to get a bus down that street with all Lots those cars Lots of people do the take the bus to do their groceries. All right, that does it for uh, that particular topic of debate. Um, next question is going to go. We come back to uh, Rosemary. Rosemary. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, Matthew, you have, uh, sorry, 30 seconds to, to wrap up this particular topic. Thanks, Eric. I've spent a considerable amount of time over the course of the last four years improving infrastructure and advocating for better infrastructure. Right out of the hop, you know, building on the work that Bob Manette did, we got St. Joseph resurfaced for the first time. Now, with the economic corridor study that we've been working on, we're improving pathways, we're ensuring that neighborhoods are connected to our main street, and we're going to see a complete revitalization of Orleans Boulevard. Room for cyclists to cycle safely, room to walk, and slowing down the traffic because it shouldn't be a main throughway. It should be our main street. All right, thank you, Matthew, for wrapping up that topic. Um, Rosemary, we come back to you for the next topic, and that topic is affordable housing. Um, it's been a hot topic, affordable housing, and the need for affordable housing, and I would say in particular the need for affordable rental housing. What are some of the recommendations you would bring as a, as a candidate, as a councillor around the table? Thank you, Derek. Living in Orleans myself, I can tell that the price of housing has gone up. People living in the community shouldn't have to move out of the community just because they can't afford housing. The average household income in Orleans is more than, I would say, some neighborhoods throughout the city. But I have to say that we need to make housing more affordable for them. What can we do to improve housing situation in Orleans? Things like making sure that we decrease the taxes will help as well. Taxes are a major issue in, a, in the city. All right, your 45 seconds are up. I now open it to all candidates for debate. 
We need to do what, uh, what Canada Lands Company did uh, for Veterans House down uh, in, at the old Rockcliffe Air Base. I find that our corporate real estate office is there to try to make the most money off of city land. Canada Lands Company sold that plot of land to a not-for-profit not developer, uh, an incredible not-for-profit developer, the Multi-Faith Housing Initiative alongside Veterans House and they sold that land for a dollar. This is what we need to be doing. The largest cost that builders are facing right now is that land value we, we're all experiencing and we're seeing how housing prices are going up. We need to do the same thing the Canada Lands Company is doing. This is public land. This is not owned uh, by individuals. It is owned by all of us and so it needs to be meeting all of our needs. And for quite some time, we've had difficulty with some of the agencies that run affordable housing. You see it online all the time. What we need to do is be partnering with people that have a proven track record on delivering affordable, accessible, uh, and inclusive housing. And multi-faith housing is, just happens to be one of them. They have lots of land across the city that we could be using for affordable housing. And we need to be selling it at a price that makes sense for those developers to be able to develop them. And those partnerships are the things that, kind of ma that, that really matter. You know, once that building was finished, 40 homeless veterans in one day were earmarked for a room. They have services in-house, they have uh, therapy in-house, and it's that kind of wraparound service that we need to be pushing for. And it's that kind of wraparound service that I'm going to be pushing for using the same model and especially to help out uh, female veterans and their families, those that have been victims of military sexual trauma, to ensure that people feel safe in their new home. When it comes to affordable housing, there's two important pieces to this castle. So the first is new development. In a place like Orleans, you can't push development that residents don't want to accept. You can't prop up massive towers, massive condos, massive apartments. A place like Orleans is fit for what's called missing middle housing. This refers to things like six-story buildings or duplexes, triplexes, or fourplexes. This is your new development that's going to help bring down the cost of rental units and bring down the cost of condos in the area. When it comes to deeply affordable housing, we need to establish a nonprofit acquisitions program at the city so that as land goes up for sale, we can acquire it, use it for not-for-profit services, and build deeply affordable housing. As well, inclusionary zoning that requires developers to earmark a specific percentage of new development to affordable housing helps keep every neighborhood accessible to people of all income levels. New programs uh, like that will drive up your property tax bill and make existing housing less affordable. It is so important that we use the land that we have already in order to meet this housing need. Purchasing land at a high watermark and then selling it off for less is simply throwing money out the window. We've got loads of public land in the east end, east of the Greenbelt, and the official plan calls for 50% of the 500,000 new families that we're going to be housing over the course of the next 50 years needs to come from intensification. And the only way to do that is obviously in a respectful manner, but we also need to ensure uh, that we are building the units and we're doing it close to transit stations and that's what the economic corridor study calls for. All right, what I will do is now uh, allow Rosemi to have her 30 seconds to wrap up this topic. Rosemi? With our growing population, affordable housing is a major issue in our community. We need to make sure that new families, people that are changing places, people that are downsizing, are able to afford their houses. How can we do that? By decreasing property taxes, this will help balance the cost of their expenses to afford housing. All right, let's move on to the next topic. Next topic, we begin with Tessa. Tessa, the environment and, and climate change has um, been a, a big issue in this particular campaign so far. What do you think the city can do at the municipal level to help combat the, the issue of the environment and climate change? Thank you, Derek. There's several things we can do. One of the easiest things is a project that's already existing that we can build on is making transit affordable and accessible for everybody. This includes reaching for things like paraparity to ensure our residents who are disabled are able to actually get where they need to go when they need to get there. 
as well, we need to make it so it is possible for people to get their groceries on the bus, because the reality is a lot of people do. It's more environmentally friendly and it builds better connections with the neighborhood. As well, we need to pursue creative climate action strategies at City Hall and be willing and open to explore new ideas to combat climate change. All right, I will now open up the floor to an open debate. Uh, candidates, uh, jump in at any time. The, the great environment is important. It is the, one of the main concerns. We need to make sure that the air that we're breathing is healthy. How can we do so? By reducing the number of cars we have on the roads, making transit more accessible and also more affordable. With the price of buses, bus fares increasing, it is not helping certain people. Also making sure that we maintain our green space. Green space is important. It is good for our mental health, our physical health, making sure that the land that we have um, is preserved. And also we need to encourage recycling, making sure that everybody is using their green bin, everybody is recycling, doing composting, that sure will make a difference throughout the community. You know, the single greatest contributor to the reduction in GHG emissions over the course of the last two years is the ability for people to work from home and work in their neighborhood. You know, when I first got elected in 2018, we were going to be doing a secondary plan just for the uh, Plaster Orleans area. I worked with Steve Willis to expand that to 800 meters around each of the transit stations to ensure that people had a place to work near home. Well, the pandemic hit, and now the 80%, you know, the, uh, the, the task force that Doug Felt made head up showed that 80% of Orleans residents and Cumberland residents were traveling through the green belt in personal vehicles to get to their job. Well, what we've done, uh, you know, through working from home is reduce that traffic, reduce, reduce that congestion, reduce the GHGs, and we need to continue to push for that. I was completely against the mayor's idea to get people back to the downtown core. All that does is cause congestion and GHG emissions. What we need to be doing is using that land downtown to provide housing for people. The only way to get vibrancy back onto streets like Sparks and the same issue on St. Joseph is to ensure that people actually live there. This is a good way to help solve the housing crisis and as well reduce GHG emissions moving forward. You know, we've built a new EV charger at, uh, at Bob uh, Macquarie. I've improved active transportation corridors and the single largest, uh, the single largest investment in our history is going on right now, stage two of LRT, and that is going to make a massive difference when you can get on a bus uh, close to your front door in five minutes, be at an LRT station, and then get downtown within 25 minutes. It's going to be a massive time saver, but what I'd rather see is you get those two hours back that you spent commuting every single day to spend with your family. It makes such a difference in your children's lives when you're there for them. Imagine being able to take them you know, to daycare every single morning like I've been able to do and see them when they come home and make dinner with them and sit and eat dinner with them and actually be a part of their lives instead of just being a bit player like we do when we have to commute all the time. In addition to transit, there is one more way to get around that is the most climate friendly and the healthiest way to get around and that's walking and biking throughout your neighborhood. I've spoken to many community groups in Orleans, and quite frankly, the options for bike lanes and active transit options are, are a little bit embarrassing, and the reality is it's also unsafe. Not only do we have to push for this from a climate action standpoint, but we have to do it and push towards what is called Vision Zero to eliminate pedestrian deaths. Many of our intersections are unsafe. They're unsafe for people on foot, and they're unsafe for people on bikes. And there are people dying for no good reason. And at City Hall, we need to push to end needless death and to give people a climate-friendly, healthy way to get around. You know, I've invested in automatic speed enforcement. I've invested in, in, in uh, infrastructure like pedestrian crossovers. And we have more crossing guards today than we ever have. I'm sorry time is up for our debate. Um, but over to you, Tessa. You have 30 seconds to wrap up this topic. We've seen with major weather events that climate change is real and it's going to get really hard for us. We need to take action that will reduce our emissions and bring more climate friendly policy to City Hall and we also need to be prepared for what's to come. And that includes drafting new updated emergency preparedness plans and improving our consultation with the community when we experience traumatic and massive weather events. 
All right, let's move on to the next topic. Um, this is for Matthew Luloff. Uh, you'll have 45 seconds for this. What are some of the tasks currently being done by the Ottawa Police Services that could perhaps be pushed over to other government services that are um, funded by the municipal government? And, and this in light, of course, of people asking for perhaps the defunding of, of the Ottawa Police Services or the freezing of its budget. That's an excellent question. And the Ottawa Police Service doesn't have an, doesn't have an adequate budget right now to do their core job, uh, which is maintaining peace and security and enforcement. The number one thing that I hear when I'm knocking on doors is that people want to see more enforcement when it comes uh, to traffic and noise complaints. It's not the same issues that we see downtown. This is a suburb and we need to make sure uh, that we take a suburban lens when discussing how to have more police uh, presence in Orleans. There are several things that the police should not be doing. Mental health crises are not something for a police officer and I've been working with the Ottawa Paramedic Service on a pilot where by we would have a psychiatric nurse deployed along uh, with uh, a paramedic uh, truck, uh, may perhaps in, in distress, a more trusted person in uniform to ensure that we're meeting those needs. All right, uh, let's open this up for debate. Uh, candidates, uh, feel very, free to jump in at any time. Very often, I would go to the park and see police cars parked there. I believe that by relating, um, relaying this task to bylaws, that would make the police officers more available to do other tasks. Also, I have to say that it would be very um, secure for the community to see more bylaws running through the parks. I've been talking to the population and they're saying that they see lots of um, people destroying the infrastructures in parks. People setting picnic tables on, t on fire, for example, by having more security in this city, then the police officers will be available to do other stuff. So one really impactful thing that we've seen in another municipality, the municipality of Red Deer actually, was that when it came to all sorts of things that the police handle, whether that's uh, traffic issues, whether that's uh, crime, theft, etc., was an implementation of a strategy that called for prevention and education. This ensured that we, over, over a long time, would actually spend less money on frontline policing. Um, we know that with almost anything, prevention and education is more impactful than response. So even things like automated speed enforcement, like school street zones, would allow us to approach this issue and handle it with education and over time be able to reduce our frontline police force because our communities would be safer. Throughout this, we would also build more connected and strong communities. Closing down uh, streets uh, that are close to schools in Orleans, East Cumberland, uh, certainly does not make sense in our context. It may make sense downtown, it may make sense in Vanier, but it does not make sense uh, in Orleans. Could you imagine the traffic and the congestion that would be caused by closing down Charlemagne to ensure uh, that, uh, you know, I don't know what, what, what goal we have uh, that, that Horizon Ottawa uh, has uh, for that, um, but we've been making our school zone safer by using automated speed enforcement. We've got two new cameras in Orleans. We have new crossing guards. Uh, we've been working very hard uh, to ensure uh, that these areas are much safer. So uh, over the last few months, an organization called School Streets Yao has been conducting surveys with candidates talking about automated speed enforcement in school streets, etc. Matt Luloth actually said he was very pro school streets and wanted to implement school streets in the I ward. I said As well, I, I would like at. to call out the That's fact that I am Tessa Franklin and I'm a candidate for me. Just because I'm endorsed by a certain organization does not mean that I am a mouthpiece for them. Oh, that's certainly not what I was suggesting whatsoever. This just happens to be the organization that's pushing the policies that you're talking about today, which is, which is fine. I mean, that's just fine. Um, when it comes to ensuring that our streets are safer, the number one priority that Orleans and Cumberland residents have is a greater police presence. In 2018, I took a ride along for an entire shift with a police officer in Orleans, and during that time, that overnight shift, there were only two police cars east of the Green Belt. That is way not enough to be dealing with the speeding issues that we're experiencing on roads like Trim, on roads like St. Joseph, on Innes, 
on Jeanne d'Arc. We need to ensure that we properly fund our police force so they can do the core job and definitely look at alternatives for some of the softer services that are required in our community. It is so important that we have the right person show up to the right call. And that doesn't necessarily mean stealing from Peter to pay Paul. What it does mean is ensuring that we're properly investing at all three levels of government in those important services like health care and mental well-being. All right, well, we'll wrap up uh, that, the debate portion of that. Uh, Matthew, you have 30 seconds to wrap up this topic. Listen, uh, like I said, uh, it, it is a complicated issue, and it's one that we've spent quite a bit of time looking at over the course of the last little bit. We have more tools in our toolbox than we ever have. And getting our streets to a place where they're safe means, you know, continuing maximizing our TTC budget, which I've done for four years, uh, installing new pedestrian crossovers, lit ones as well, making sure that road configurations don't, uh, don't allow people to drive 60 to 100, and ensuring uh, that the right person shows up to the right uh, All incident. right, that does it for uh, the wrap-up of that topic. Now, we're going to switch gears a bit. We've got some questions coming up, and I'll give each candidate 60 seconds. No debate for these particular questions. I'm just going to throw the topic out there, uh, the question out there, and you'll have 60 seconds to respond. I'll start with you, Rosemary. Um, there's been a lot of criticism surrounding the public-private partnerships, the P3 contracts. Um, some have obviously been more successful than others. Do you see... Um, do you believe there's a place for these contracts? And if so, how would we avoid the pitfalls in the future? Thank you, Derek. That is an excellent question. Um, I have to say that I would rather see Petrie remain what it is. Petrie is a treasure. It's a treasure to our community. It is a peaceful, green environment. Oh, I think, I, I, sorry, Rosemary, I think you've got um, the, the wrong idea. I'm talking about the the contracts, uh, for instance, LRT, uh, the Lansdowne contract, that public-private partnership contract. Um, do you believe that there's a place for those? And if so, how do we avoid the pitfalls in the future? Thank you. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, I believe that those contracts, uh, the place is not at Petrie. We should try to move them elsewhere. Let's keep Petrie as it is. Um, yes, those contracts, if the LRT brings more people to Orleans and the LRT is working as it should, it will bring more business for our local businesses in the area. But I believe that the way things are, that's how they should stay. All right. Um, Tessa, you'll have 60 seconds as well for this topic. So we've seen P3 contracts and we've seen them go really, really wrong. Uh, we've seen the LRT, we've seen lands down. These have been massive burdens on taxpayers. And if we did this and focused on making these publicly owned and for the public, we wouldn't have to deal with so much of the mess that private consortiums and private companies bring in. We saw with the inquiry into the LRT that many people were lining their pockets with a lot of money. And this was because we got private companies involved in what is public infrastructure. We know it's better when it's done public and we need to keep it public. All right, Matthew, you have 60 seconds for the same topic. Public-private partnerships protect taxpayers uh, at, at a, a, in, in, a, in a huge way. Could you imagine uh, having to pay uh, for the sinkhole during the LRT project yourself out of your own pocket? We didn't have to do that because we successfully uh, sought legal action against the consortium that, that ran that project. Every single time the city has held uh, the public-private partnership partners to account, we have won. Every single time. That is saving you millions and millions of dollars. When you have a private company partner with you on something that they have expertise in, that means that you don't have to hire thousands of people at the City of Ottawa and pay their salaries and benefits, and we get the same or better service every single time uh, when we partner with private industry. It's so important that we let people that are experts at these things do their jobs, fund them properly, and hold them to account when they don't. It is so, so important that we don't continue this rhetoric that triple P's don't work because they do. All right, uh, that's our time for that topic. I will bring the next topic uh, to you, Tessa. You'll have 60 seconds for this topic. Um, there's a lot of concern over the city's growing debt. Where would you set tax increases over the next four years, taking that into account? 
Thank you, Derek. That's a very important uh, question, as we're all feeling the squeeze of inflation. I believe that we can keep taxes about where they are now. I think the 2%, 3% increase is reasonable if we get smart with our spending. This mean th means things like not giving $3 million tax cuts to Porsche dealerships, and being mindful about our spending on projects. Um, while we do have a lot of debt, we also do have a lot of liquid assets. So I think one thing as well is really getting the public involved and making it easier for the public to understand where our city finances are at. We shouldn't be requiring regular people to sift through three to 600 page documents to try and actually understand where we're at financially. If you look into the meat and potatoes of it, there's a lot of stuff about our finances that actually look good. It's just that people don't hear about that on the news because it doesn't make a good headline. All right, Matthew, same, same question to you. Well, um, sorry, Derek, do you mind repeating it? Yeah, no, certainly. Lost my um, for a, moment there. a lot of people are concerned about the growing debt uh, uh, yes. for many different you, reasons. You how, how would you set the, the uh, tax rate over the next four years, taking that into account? There, there are several things that the city can be doing to ensure that uh, we are not using our uh, residents as a piggy bank, uh, which we have continued to do over the course of the last few decades. You're about to get hit with a massive impact assessment next year, which means your property taxes, uh, the increase is going to be set by the province and not by us. We cannot continue to pile on there. There are loads of things that the city does that is the responsibility of another order of government, like uploading the 174. That would save us five million dollars. It's a piece of infrastructure that's used from people, uh, used by people from Clarence Rockland, and not necessarily always from the people that are working from home here in Orleans. Uh, it is so important that what we do is make sure that we're getting the best bang for our buck. We reduce. Uh, the, the tax burden on things that we're not responsible for and ensure that we look at everything, how we do it, achieve efficiencies and ensure that we're not continuously using you as a piggy bank. Two to three percent plus an impact assessment, not sustainable in the future. Rosemary, where would you set uh, the tax increases over the next four years taking the debt into account? Taking debts into account, we need to make sure that our taxes money are going where it should be going. Our taxes money should be helping the community throughout to decrease um, things that we can decrease and also make sure that taxes that we pay are not only used by the city to do things that are not necessarily what are priorities for us. We need to make sure that at least our taxes are doing things that are meaningful to us. All right. Uh, you have some more time, Rosemary. Is that you're good? Okay. All right. Uh, let's move on to the next question. This is for you, Matthew. You'll st uh, you'll start off this one in January 2020. The city of Ottawa declared a homelessness emergency. Um, that situation has only worsened um, since since that announcement was made. What recommendations would you make to help tackle that issue? Yeah, that, that, is, a, that is a massive issue that we're facing as a city and as the the chair of. Uh, community Protective Services over the course of the last two years, we've seen a massive budget, baseline budget increase uh, in the spending that we do on affordable housing. The baseline for affordable housing uh, back uh, in the, the early 2000s was $1 million a year. And through the work that we did at the committee and at council, that's looking more like 22 to 25 million dollars a year. That is a massive increase in spending uh, on affordable housing. Like I said before, partnering, uh, partnering uh, with not-for-profit agencies that know how to deliver these services in an efficient manner and uh, ensuring that we're not trying to always get the best bang for our buck when it comes to the land that's going to be used for these projects. You know, imagine uh, if we were to properly use the land at the Cloverleaf intersections along the LRT and put affordable housing close to transit. That's city-owned land. Why don't we sell it uh, to a group uh, like, uh, like Windmill or uh, another not-for-profit uh, and build more affordable housing where it's needed most? All right, time's up. Over to you, Tessa, um, on the topic of homelessness. Yes, so we've been in this crisis for was it, two, almost three years now, um, and it, it is important. And I think the city needs to work together. This isn't an urban or rural issue. This is something where we all have to, have to pitch in and contribute and work together. I'm a firm believer that housing first strategies with effective wraparound services are not only more ex effective, but they're cheaper in the long run. 
Um, you can find online through programs like Starts With Home and researching through their work that they've already done to present this to people. Alternate Level Care is going to run $30,900 a month. Housing First Strategies with wraparound services, just under $1,900. Between what we spend on motels and emergency shelters, if we took that money and did it right the first time, we would not only save money, but we'd be able to give dignity back to people and help get them back on their feet. All right, Rosemary, same topic for you. You have 60 seconds. We're faced with a crisis with homeless people. We, I have to say that it is all a domino effect. Yes, we need to make housing more affordable, but not only that, we need to work and increase services for mental health. Mental health is a major stress. Mental health with COVID did not help, right? So making sure that the, the people have more access to services. When they're in crisis, there's people that they can call to help them. Making sure that they have uh, lines like crisis lines more available, making sure that they, they have a place that they can go and not be ashamed, then that sure will make good impact on them. We don't need to wait for the person to be at the end of the ladder to try to reach out and help them. Let's help them when it's time and, of course, make housing more affordable for everyone. Thank you, Rosemary. All right, now it is time for our closing statements. We'll do that in reverse order, and we are starting off with you. Matthew, Matthew Luloff, you have uh, 60 seconds. Neighbors, the last four years have been tough on all of us, but none of the challenges we face together stopped me from delivering and making major progress on every single one of my 2018 campaign commitments. Council is about to vote on the biggest and most comprehensive economic and planning policy Orleans has ever had, and will deliver more housing at all levels, a walkable and cyclable St. Joseph with amenities and vibrancy that we've been craving for decades in our old downtown, and that Kanata has gotten, but we haven't. I've been open, honest, and transparent about the decisions that I've made, never holding back on how I really feel. And I've made strong connections with the community and the city staff that help me every single day to deliver results for you. I know you and you know me because I've been serving you in one way or another for my entire life as a Boy Scout, a lifeguard, a soldier both at home and abroad, and as a political staffer on Parliament Hill, and now as your city councillor. On October 24th, the choice is clear. Let's get back to work. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Tessa Franklin, you have 60 seconds for your closing statement. Thank you to Derek and thank you to the other candidates today. Um, my campaign is about working hard for residents, not developers, not special interests, nobody else, just residents. Together we can make things like affordable housing, quality transit, accessible social services, and serious climate action a reality. I'm working hard to earn your trust and your respect. You'll see me at the doors, you're hearing me on the phones, and you'll see me at events. Hopefully, on, in October, I can earn your vote as well. I'd like to build a ward where we're looked at as neighbors, not customers. All right, thank you very much, Tessa. Rosemary Cantav, you have the final closing statement. You have 60 seconds. Thank you, Derek. I am a mother. I'm a wife. I'm a professional. I'm a neighbor. I live in a community, and I see what's wrong with the community. I'm also here to listen to the population and know what their real expectations are. I will work tirelessly to improve what matters most to us. We have the same interests. We want to live in a community that is safe, a community where there's no speeding in our streets, knowing that our children are safe playing on the streets. We want to live in a place where transit is not a major issue. We have access to the services and also affordable housing. We want to build more cycling paths Let's transform our community into a place that is peaceful and enjoyable, a place that will attract tourists and where everyone would want to live. Thank you very much, Rosemary, and that does it for our debate today with uh, Ward 1, 
Orleans East Cumberland. Uh, thanks to all of our candidates for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thanks to you for watching at home. A reminder, our municipal election, October the 24th, and we'll be doing continual debates here on Rogers TV, and you can find them on our website and on our YouTube channel. Thanks so much for joining us here on The Local Campaign.